Good morning, friends, and welcome back to NPTEL online certification course on Indian poetry in English. You might well remember that till now we have covered many major poets who have been writing or composing poetry in English. Today we are going to start with one such name without whom Indian poetry in English would be incomplete. And the name is that of our Parthasarthi. Now, one question that might be cropping up in many minds is that our Parthasarthi was simply an editor. And we have already quoted on a number of occasions one of his collections where he has given chances to many Indian poets writing in English. But then R. Parthasarthi himself was a renowned poet. Of course, his poetic contribution may not be as rich or as more in number if compared to some other poets. But then with only one collection which actually became a major work of Indian poetry in English, R. Parthasarthi has been able to create vibes, bubbles and many questions that many other poets have already discussed in their poetic stride. Now, before we come uh, to uh, discuss R. Parthasarthi, because I have put R. Parthasarthi uh, in a different section and the section is ethnographic voices in Indian poetry in English. I think many people might still consider R. Parthasarthi to be a diasporic Indian uh, poet, but I think uh, the way R. Parthasarthi's lines go on and they actually depict he actually is an ethnographic voice. Now, you might be eager enough to know what actually are ethnographic voices. My dear friends, those people who are practicing ethnographic voices, they are actually the people who write about a particular region, culture or linguistic tradition. In that light, even the famous celebrated poet a. K. Ramanujan could also have been put here, but then Ramanujan did not have that much of repentance if compared to the remorse and the repentance, disillusionment and the frustration that R. Parthasarthi had. Because right from the beginning, R. Parthasarthi, like any other Indian, boasted of, thought of and actually could see also dreams of writing in English but writing in English by being an English poet also. Of course, with a change of time and with his own experiences, he himself changed his own vision and his outlook on life and that we shall see. We have in this regard found some ethnographic voices whose works are very much rooted uh, in their uh, uh, region or in their own state are Jaint Mahapatra from Orisha, we have already discussed his poems. Then we can also find about uh, such a sort of feeling and experience quite uh, you know assertive and determined in the voices of Esther in Kir, Temsula Ao from Northeast, Jakinta Kerketa from an Urao Adivasi community. And when we talk about Parthasarthi, our Parthasarthi, it is actually from a Tamil linguistic tradition's voice. Now, such poets, they show a concern for local culture. So, once we come across, we will find local culture, local identity. I mean, everything that is specific in terms of their own language, their own climate and of course, uh, their own culture that actually makes them uh, represent ethnographic voices. Even the images and the themes that are drawn and that are portrayed in their poetry, they also 
have got an imprint of indigenous culture, indigenous culture, a culture of their own, a culture which actually sings of nativity songs, a culture that talks about the native tradition and all. Now, there comes a question which uh, many of uh, us might think that in this regard, even Adil Jassawala was one such voice. And in uh, a major book uh, by Bruce King, Bruce King has compared Adil Jassawala and R. Partha Sarthi. But where lies the difference? Adil Jassawala actually, even when he was in England or in some other in a foreign country, majority of the times he used to think of, but then he also tried to see that how he could create a sort of connection. But when we come to Mahapatra, we find a note of disillusionment, we find a note of embarrassment and uh, in, in uh, one poem after another, he actually has been saying that perhaps majority of us are derooted, uprooted majority of us have actually left our own legacies. In this regard, at times uh, Partha Sarthi is full of admiration for A. K. Ramanujan, who also used to think about his family bonds, family connections and many more. Now, the major elements of such ethnographic voices may include memory as we can find in the works of A. K. Ramanujan. Fine past nostalgia, distinctive identity, regional problems, cultural history, even the themes and imageries that we have been mentioning from time to time, they utilize local knowledge. We, we have already found uh, while we were discussing uh, A.K. Ramanujan that how he talks about Indian traditions, Indian superstitious beliefs, how the snakes were revered, fine. And then he also talks about the conflict between the tradition and then the science, the be between rational, between belief, between philosophy. So, folk traditions, nature and contemporary social issues, of course, they become very characteristic in the ethnographic voices. They are also aware of the decaying of their local identity. Local identity nowadays, a uh, local is actually being dissolved into global and that is why the local touches are missing. We have uh, even, even we have found uh, such a sort of uh, you know vestiges in the poetic world of Nisi Mijikil where he also has written unfinished man, unfinished man. Again we have also talked about uh, in one of the uh, poets, the missing person the missing person, fine. So, the local identity because of globalization, colonization or neo-colonialism. Uh, actually, R. Partha Sarthi thought uh, that many of us Indians, even when we are writing in English, perhaps we are trying to imitate and we are trying to imitate in such a manner uh, that we neither become Indian writers nor become English and that is why he is full of admiration uh, for one of the uh, most you know uh, insignificant voices of Indian uh, poetry in English and that was of Madhushudan Dutt who actually abandoned writing in English and came to start writing in Bengali and so is the case also with our Parthasarthi who as we will find later who finally turned not only towards translation, but also towards depicting his uh, Tamil culture, uh, his Tamil motives, his uh, Tamil traditions and all. Actually, when we talk about ethnographic voices, we are to be aware that cultural expression is the hallmark. It is actually the key element. And uh, of course, it may deal with the two cultures. There is a uh, depiction of biculturalism that also we can find. But let us first try to understand who this man R. Partha, Partha Sarthi was. Actually, R. Partha Sarthi, whose full name was Raja Gopal Partha Sarthi. He was born near uh, uh, Trichurapalli in uh, Tamil Nadu in a Brahmin family in the year 1934. His early education uh, was in local schools, but later on he got chances uh, to study not only in Mumbai, but he also got a fellowship at Leeds. And uh, after having done his education, 
and then in 1971 he joined because early days he spent uh, in in the publishing industry uh, he also took up uh, some jobs in mumbai's uh, mithibai college uh, and then in 1971, he became the regional editor of Madras region of OUP, fine. And then he also served as a British uh, Council Scholar at Leeds University, UK. Baad Parthasarthi is actually an Indian poet, translator, editor and critic of great repute. I think uh, R. Parthasarthi deserves a special accolades because it was he who brought 10 you know, Indian English poets and to limelight and then his work has become a classic. Uh, Parthasarthi was conferred with the Ulka Poetry Prize uh, in 1966 and then he was also a member of the National Academy of Letters, New Delhi. Later on, he also became a professor of English and Asian Studies at Skidmore College, uh, Saratoga Springs, New York. Actually, it was for his translation, fine, uh, that in 1996, uh, Parthasarthi was uh, awarded Sahitya Academy Award. As, as we have mentioned earlier that Parthasarthi did not have uh, uh, many uh, poetry collections like many of his predecessors, but one collection only of him actually made him so famous and that was called Rough Passage. When we shall take up the lines of Rough Passage, you will come to know what sort of poetry are Parthasarthi writes because Parthasarthi, uh, uh, majority of his poems in the rough passage, they are like triads, I mean three liners and uh, they are written in uh, free verse, there may not be any musicality because the flow is quite natural and through his poetry, while one can find autobiographical echoes in his poetry, one can also find the depiction of life one leads in a foreign country and then what sort of remorse does one have. So, that is quite uh, evident once one reads uh, the uh, poems of uh, uh, Rough Passage. He also had uh, another collection, I mean uh, prior to the publication of Rough Passage because early poems of R. Parthasarthi were deep in love. We shall take some of uh, them also and he got uh, many of his poems uh, published in many of the journals, fine. So, poetry from Leeds came out in 1968 and Rough Passage came in 1977. Rough Passage actually made R. Parthasarthi very famous. Uh, Parthasarthi also edited as I have been saying. 10 20th century Indian poets, fine, 10 20th century Indian poets, fine and uh, uh, actually he also had certain translations, uh, one of the translations entitled the tale of an anklet, an epic of South India actually uh, brought him Sahit Academy Award in 1996. Even he has also translated many of the Sanskrit poems. And uh, these Sanskrit poems he has translated in such a fashion that they actually give you a real picture of erotic poems, uh, something that is uh, dipped in love, that is dipped in the depiction of body, that is depiction in sexuality, that is de a depiction of uh, you know uh, the union of two lovers. So, erotic poems from the Sanskrit and anthology that also was uh, uh, to uh, the credit of our Parthasarthi. Uh, now, let us take uh, some poems uh, from his early days as I have been saying uh, because R. Parthasarthi right from the beginning wanted to uh, feel himself as an Englishman. That is why his fascination for uh, English language was too much. But then as he progressed what he himself had said, English forms a part of my intellectual rational makeup intellectual and rational makeup. But the question is, did he really uh, get the satisfaction with this intellectual and rational makeup? Because he himself says, Tamil of my emotional psychic makeup. So, when as a poet, you have uh, your own language as an emotional and psychic makeup, naturally what you write in other languages will ultimately provide you or will ultimately result into a sort of disillusionment and a sort of desperation and disappointment followed by a sort of dejection. 
and that is already reflected in majority of the poems of our Parthasarthi. Let us take for example, one poem which was published in one of uh, the uh, journals uh, uh, and the poem is titled Another Sky, Another Sky, look at, look at the title of the poem Another Sky. And once we go through the lines, we can find what he says and is there a sort of or is there uh, a, a, a picture of the disillusionment because when he says he had spent his youth whoring after the English gods. I mean, Arparthi Sarthi was uh, quite confident uh, that the language which we have been following, I mean the language that we have been imitating. It is just like whoring after the English gods. So, perhaps we are giving a more weightage, we are giving a more uh, say credit to English language. And then in uh, uh, poems after poems, he says that how his uh, tongue was chained. Chained why? Chained because of this foreign language. There is something to be said for exile. So, uh, the very first part of his uh, famous uh, collection rough passage is also exile. You know rough passage is uh, divided into three sections and the very first section is entitled exile, fine. Now in exile what sort of experiences one can have? You learn roots are deep. Of course, when you are whoring after the English gods, so English gods here is a sort of dig, uh, uh, you learn roots are deep, that language is a tree, loses color under another sky. Your own language, your own mother tongue that actually gets, even, even though language is a sheltering tree my dear friend, fine, but then it loses its color under another sky, the bark disappears with the first snow. So, when you visit a different country and you try to uh, put yourself according to the language that is spoken there or that is in communication there, the bark disappears with the first snow. So, now this snow is actually reflects no, the snow of England. It disappears with the first snow and branches become hoarse. So, you actually start losing your grip over your own mother tongue. My dear friends, is that not a reality and uh, does that not uh, uh, make uh, our Parthasarthi a realist? It is, it is not like uh, Varati Mukherjee or it is not like Kamla Das who says the language I speak in become minds. But here is a poet who says uh, that one loses one's language under another sky. Now, let us come uh, to his major celebrated and seminal work that is rough passage. Uh, the rough passage title itself is very symbolic. So, it, it symbolizes how the poet when he was in England because this uh, collection is uh, um, a sort of description of 15 years of his poetry writing even though it came out in 1977, but then it has got 15 years of the experience of uh, the poet. It has got three sections and all these sections are quite long enough, fine. And the first section is entitled exile, the second is entitled trial and the third finally you know where do we return to? We return to our homeland and through these uh, titles also we can find how the poet also comes to a sort of reconciliation. But then when the poet comes to a reconciliation, what are the experiences that we shall find my dear friends. Let us go deep into uh, the poetic over of our Parthasarthi. This collection has got 39 poems. In a way as I have been saying, it is a sort of poetic biography. There are autobiographical notes. The poet compares his stay in England and then because you know the poet believes that his stay in England could not make him a man. We will we'll come to those lines as well. It delineates his poetic experience and the entire collection is a record of the poet's disillusionment. So, the first section in exile where the poet feels uh, there is a loss of identity and a loss of language. 
loss of identity and a loss of language. But then the second section which is called trial, here the poet actually tries to recuperate, the poet actually tries to recover, he tries to make himself a man, himself a man and the poet actually tries to neutralize uh, the feeling of alienation uh, with the celebration of love. Maybe it is also soaked in some amount of memory, some amount of dream, but then the elements of disillusionment and cultural conflict is found in abundance in exile. The poet is in, in, in true sense, he is exiled within his own mind and the poet will realize of late that what he thought of early was not actually the true path. He explores the alienation which is actually caused by the geographical distances and the poet is distanced from his own culture, from his own tradition and from his own language my dear friend. Now when we come to the next one, we will of course see, but in the first one he finds the love for his culture missing, his mother tongue being lost fine. There is also a sort of class between two cultures, the Indian culture and the European culture. At times we come across the elements of sensuousness also, uh, like because you know it is all, uh, many people have often gone to the extent of saying that rough patches is like T.S. Eliot's wasteland and uh, there are several touches one can find in the poetic world, uh, in the poetic world of our Parthasarthi. Uh, but then the poet actually tries to mend his own fences uh, with uh, the dialogue of the past and he says just in the beginning. However, the most reassuring thing about the past is that it happened. It cannot be changed now. It happened. It has already happened. I have put aside the past in a corner, an umbrella now poor in the ribs. Now you look at the words, this word umbrella is also sheltering like the language, no? The poet says language is like a tree, it loses its color fine under another sky. So umbrella, he says I have put aside the past, my own traditions, my own legacies, my own cultures, my own language in a corner, an umbrella now poor in the ribs it appears. Now the ribs of the umbrella have become very poor, it cannot hold my dear friend, it cannot provide me the sort of shelter. So let us uh, depict one by one, we will uh, take the first section first. As we have said, the title itself, exile, all of us are familiar with the word exile. It is a sort of banishment from one's own culture, one's own native to a different one, to a strange one. So it delineates his traumatic experience in England. It also shows the cultural conflict between the two cultures that is European and the Indian or the Asian culture. The poet has himself said in some of uh, his lines uh, and he has already recorded the effects of colonialism, you know. So, in order uh, to get oneself attached to the root, what is essential is to decolonize ourselves. So, the effects of colonialism on Indian society and in Indian linguistic tradition. Actually, R. Parthasarthi as a poet was trying to find out where is the Indian locale and where is the Indian tradition and that actually makes R. Parthasarthi a most loved poet. There are instances of dislocation alienation and trauma which have actually been caused by colonialism, fine. Uh, there is also a special focus on the decay, on the deterioration of Tamil, I mean you know Tamil has got uh, two languages, one is classic now which is often when we worship God, so that, that actually is a classic Tamil, fine, so far as my knowledge is concerned. And, and then uh, there is a decay of such a classical language of Tamil, a uh, feeling of dissatisfaction even in India as the condition is the same. Now you will find that when uh, the poet, poet actually had gone to London to find uh, that it is actually a land of opportunities of dreams of a new sort of development, but then uh, the, the way he got himself disillusioned with the uh, circumstances and the situations. So to him even the Westminster Bridge 
appears to have no attraction now. Uh, the poet as he says, the Angrej impudently rub salt in our wounds, our pride bites the dust, still pullulate the decrepit ruins, now blood trickle down the Jamuna while the emperor flies indecisive kites. While the emperor flies indecisive kites, look at the use of the words indecisive kites. So, these indecisive kites are the indecisive ambitions, my dear friend. We are flying these indecisive ambitions, but perhaps we ignore the fact that we are still imitating, we are whoring after the English gods. Let us take some lines from the exile in order to see what the poet thinks. As I have already told you, that exile is the experience of the first phase when the poet had been in England. Uh, the lines are so simple that you will be uh, in a position uh, to relate uh, to the meaning and uh, the words uh, uh, used are also very simple because as a poet when we uh, talk about uh, uh, our Parthasarthi, we can, uh, we can find uh, that the entire uh, poetic collection is not only a delineation of frustration, but then there is also a sort of economy of expression. Uh, there is also a, a sort of the subtle use of certain words in order uh, to make others aware what sort of stay one has when one is in a foreign country. Through the holes, this is actually, through the holes in a wall, as it were, lamps burned in the fog, in a basement flat, conversation filled the night, while Rabi Sankar, cigarette stubs, empty bottles of stout and crisps provided the necessary pauses. The poet actually takes a dig here because Rabi Shankar did not consider himself to be an Indian. He was so much influenced by uh, the other cultures that he considered himself not of India. Uh, fine, the way uh, the poets like R. Parthasarthi and A. K. Ramanujam considered. That is why he says, while Rabi Shankar cigarette stubs, empty bottles of stout and crisps provided the necessary pauses. He had spent his youth whoring after English gods. Look at the use of the words whoring after English gods. There is something to be called for exile. So, life in a foreign country is just another form of exile, another form of banishment. You learn, it is only when you go there, then you realize what sort of indecisive kites we are flying, my dear friends. You learn, roots are deep that language is a tree, loses color under another sky. So, all your ambitions of flying kites, all your ambitions of your choices, all your ambitions of being great, they actually are just like indecisive kites. They are uh, some of the traces of your determination which was only on a very weak ground. The bark disappears as we have already discussed these lines. The bark disappears with the snow and branches become hoarse. However, the most assuring thing about the past is that it happened dressed in tweeds or grey flannel, its suburban pockets bursting with immigrants. Coloreds is what they call us. Look at, look at the reaction that these people show us. Look at the comments that these people pass on us. We are considered, we are considered coloreds is what they call us. Over there, the city is no jewel either. And what is there? Because you had high Im uh, aspirations and imaginations. And the poet says, lanes full of smoke and litter with puddles of unwashed English children. Fine, if you simply think that uh, going to a foreign country and you will find uh, that there is a sort of Elysium. No, my dear friend, you are not right. There are also uh, lanes full of smokes and litter with puddles of unwashed English children. Fine. And then he says, even if you happen to stand on the West Westminster Bridge, it seemed the Thames had clogged, even if the river that you feel that it is very glorified, no, 
we we often think of thames even in our dreams and we read of about them as uh, something uh, great but then the poet says it seemed the thames had clogged the chariot wheels of boadisha to stone and then finally he says the ears have given me little wisdom if people like me who think that going to england will make me a gentleman and i will be quite a wise man so the ears have given me little wisdom it has given me less wisdom and i have dislodged myself look at the use of words i have dislodged myself to find it here on the banks of hogley fine so the situation is no different my dear friend if you simply believe of having castles in the air perhaps you are not right i must give quality to the other half it is only one of my halves so i must think because you know there is actually a conflict and there is a conflicting emotion now between emotion and ambition so he says i must give quality to the other half i have forfeited the embarrassing gift innocence in my scramble to be man perhaps i could not realize that it was my innocence and now what should i do i must now realize fine and i must de- discover myself i must think of my other self because innocence in my scramble to be man and that is why with this we come uh, to the next step and that step will be trial because the poet thought that all his all his efforts that he had thought of in order to become wise perhaps those have been wasted and i have got very little wisdom my dear friend so let us think let us uh, think of how i can recuperate how i can recover my dear friend and this is possible and this is what he depicts in the other section entitled trial the poet actually at times there is a sense of atonement for what he did so the trial is about the trial of his own existence about his own making about his own being about his own becoming where he perhaps thinks that it is only the force of love that can mitigate all his anxieties it is only the force of love that can actually help him recuperate it is only the passion of love that can help him overcome and that is why love only is a purifying no force that can purify his soul and this is only way to redeem himself of all that he thought of in earlier days so the trial also describes the complexities which come in the way of making love and in the moment of ecstasy now here is another experience in the moments of ecstasy one actually forgets the material existence and the material existence is so dull drab so the poet actually wants now to float on in order to recover himself from all sorts of feelings from all sorts of experiences that he had and that is why here in this section he celebrates not only the body but also the soul one can also find uh, the touches of carnal desires at times being satisfied or dissatisfied let us uh, take some of the lines a knock on the door you entered undressed quietly before the mirror of my hands eyes drowned in the skull edge flesh hardened to stone so let us take some lines from uh, this section also the trial which is actually the making and the becoming of the man over the family album now here you know here we can find how he follows or imitates ak ramanujan and he has also mentioned uh, that uh, in this regard ramanujan had got an upper hand he actually wanted to create a sort of link a sort of connection with his family members and that is why in his poetic world we find memory working great where through his memory he often thinks of his own nostalgic feelings being satisfied over the family album the other night i shared your childhood the unruly hair silenced by bob pins now he thinks of all those people who in his childhood were friends maybe some of the cousins and after after you know some years perhaps when he can find them he will find them not only into a grown up 
but then they can sometimes become the father and the mother and might be holding several responsibilities. Silenced by bob pins and ribbons, eyes half shut before the fear's glass, a ripple of arms round Suniti's neck, round Suniti's neck. So, Indian touches here and in the distance, a squatting on fabulous haunches of all things the Taj. So, the, pay, uh, the poet also here travels in the memory lane and then he also imagines a lot of things, the childhood experiences and uh, his own experiences, his own accompaniment with all those people or with whom he had spent uh, the childhood joys and the childhood sorrows. School was a pretty kettle of fish, the spoonfuls of English brew never quite slaked your thirst. Those were the day days when the spoonfuls of English brew never quite slaked your thirst. Hand on chin you grew up. Maybe this is some of uh, the very near and dear uh, ones about whom the poet is actually depicting. Hand on chin in the poet's mind and in the poet's memory he finds hand on chin you grew up all along on the cook's succulent folklore you rolled yourself. No, there was place for memory, there was place for story and this actually uh, takes us back to the world of A.K. Ramanujam and many others who used to say about the grandmother's stories that used to bring or that used to induce sleep. Into the ball the afternoon father died till time unfurled you like a peal of bells, how your face bronzed as flesh and bone struck a touch of day, pursed you turned the corner in child's steps. And then having travel in the world of memory, because we know you do not have uh, much time uh, to uh, discuss in detail, but then having celebrated some you know love making unfolding uh, some experiences of love. Now, the poet in this section which is entitled Homecoming where he explores the phenomena of return and reconciliation. Return and reconciliation are the two things that many of the existential thinkers have also talked about and the poet like an existential persons, he actually wants to return to his own roots and while returning to his own roots, Perhaps the poet will also talk about in the same way the, the, uh, the uh, famous uh, uh, romantic poet John Kitts had said, I returned home tired, my face pressed against the window of expectation. So, finally, it is only the home that can address all your problems and he says, the linguistic dilemma, dilemma that the poet had experienced that actually becomes the major problem in this section. And here is one who tries to reclaim his own past and then he says, how long can foreign poets provide the staple of your lines? Can they really provide the staple of your lines? Turn inward and what is actually the solution? The solution is turn inward. So, when he says turn inward, once again he refers to a sort of homecoming, scrap the bottom of your past. It is only your past that can actually help. Even when you are in a foreign country and you find yourself lost, bewildered, dazed, fine, disappointed, it is only the homecoming that can actually uh, soothe all your frustrations and anxieties. The poet has at one place said, I now firmly believe that I should not write poems in any other language, but only in Tamil. That is how all my anxieties are will be over. And he says, I am no longer myself as I watch the evening blur the traffic to a pair of obvious headlights. I am no longer myself. I find myself that my, it was it was actually a sort of indecision of mine to go to a foreign country. But now, I return home tired, my face pressed against the window of expectation. I climb the steps to my flat only to trip over the mat outside the door. The key goes to sleep in my palm. 
I fear I have bungled again that last refinement of speech terrifies me. The balloon of poetry has grown red in the face with repeated bowing for scriptures. I therefore recommend and what do I recommend? The humble newspaper. I find my prayers occasionally answered there. I shall perhaps go on like this. Unmindful of day melting into the night, my heart I have turned inside out. Hereafter, I should be content. Perhaps it is only the homecoming that will actually provide me with a sort of contentment. I should be content, I think, to go through life with the small change of uncertainties. My dear friends, even though Parthasarthi is considered to be a poet who was actually sandwiched between anxiety, between disappointment and then who wanted to come back to his home. But how can one come back to one's home and have the satisfaction? So, Parthasarthi has been considered a poet who talks about diasporic experiences, but home is the only reality. But it would perhaps be injustice not to consider our Parthasarthi a poet who also talks about love. We can take uh, one poem because the time is not on our part. And here we can take one poem uh, which has been uh, taken from the concise Kama Sutra. The concise Kama Sutra. Let us uh, read the lines so that you can get a sort of semblance. Under the warm cover let my woman slip shone. I am drenched in the intractable scent of hair. The lines are uh, very smooth, uh, very simple. The notion has often crossed my mind, I should crumple it up like a handkerchief that I could press to my face from time to time. Meanwhile, wakeful hand peel the skin of the night, I drink from her tongue in the dark. Our breath tips the room over to one side, the tight hardwood floor groans under the slew of discarded clothes, we shut the whole untidy threadbare world out. Dogs, telephones, even the small indifferent rain. I mean, here the poet actually refers to a sort of union, fine, refers to a, a sort of longing, a longing when uh, they actually unite. As you untie your long flowing hair in bed, we have already said the poet at times becomes very sensuous. It is spreads over slowly and colors the seats, leaving behind a pool of black caught in the red glare of the lamplight. You turn towards me, disturbing the pool. Hands and tongues lose no time in spinning their moist web. And we fall into their delicate net. Day breaks, the window empties its pail. Of light over us, waking us up. It is our sweat now that colors the seats. It is the clean scent of your hair in the morning that keeps me awake and I am unable to rise. So, there are several romantic touches and sensuous details are also there. Uh, you can read uh, it at your own leisure and find out the beautiful meaning that is hidden within. If we can have a look at, because we have already discussed the world of uh, uh, our Parthasarthi, uh, we can find out why our Parthasarthi should be included and should be considered as a major Indian English poet is, because we find the representation of Indian ethos, fine. Uh, abundant in majority of his poems. There is of course, uh, a sense of loss and despair. The poet is sandwiched between the identity of language, identity of tongue and the identity of culture. Alienation from his own culture and tradition makes the poet sad. The racial prejudice and the imperialistic mindset, which actually is a result of the colonialism, the poet is actually a rebel against that. The linguistic dilemma that prompts poet to lose are the tree of language which actually shelters and the poet is found in a cultural uh, dilemma. It won't be fair if we do not take some of the critical comments about Parthasarthi's views. Uh, many of the poets, some of uh, the critics have uh, criticized Parthasarthi and they have said whether Parthasarthi was able to or not. In this regard, what M. K. Naik says is, it is a moot point whether the poet has been actually able to achieve all that he promised, a general impression of disjointedness. So, 
Nayak finds a sort of disjointedness, uh, but then uh, this can be considered to be a sort of opinion which is not quite favorable. But then he fails to be a national odyssey. Of course, he did not want a sort of national odyssey. He actually wanted a sort of regional odyssey where Tamil was uh, too much on his mind. It does have evocative passages recording a personal peregration. So, whatever be there, but there is a personal journey, there is a personal peregration. And what Bruce King says can be a very beautiful, uh, you know, a comment about the poet. Although Parthasarthi's poetry is more openly autobiographical than Eliot's, he edits and revises. My dear friends, rough passage was revised several times, uh, like T. S. Eliot's uh, The Wasteland. But then uh, this revision was done by Parthasarthi himself, whereas in the case of T.S. Eliot, we find there were many people uh, who actually uh, made certain revisions. Uh, Parthasarthi edits and revises it to achieve an impersonal distance through coolness of tone, regularity of form, economy of language and by the juxtaposition of images which situate his own life in the context of colonialism. The decay of the grandeur of the Indian past and the ossification of Tamil culture along with its accompanying modern vulgarity. Now, having discussed uh, the poetic over of our Parthasarthi or Rajagopal Parasarthi, it is time uh, to uh, bring this lecture to an end, but not without Parthasarthi's own lines, where he says, my tongue in English chains I return. After a generation to you, I am at the end of my dravidic tither, hunger for you. Still unassuaged, I falter, I stumble. And what can give him an established home? Nothing but his own culture, nothing but his own language, nothing but his own identity. And with his own identity only, he can claim what he had thought of because all his ambitions that he had been soaring high and flying kites perhaps were false and that is what the poet has himself realized. With this, we come to the end of this talk. Thank you very much. I wish you all a good day ahead. Thank you.